and I'm so happy and uh, pleased to be starting us off and um, feel very privileged to be able to be here with you today to share a little bit about some very new research uh, that I've been working on with my research group, uh, research that absolutely would not have been possible without the support of, of CIFAR. I'd like to talk with you today about conflict in schools and specifically conflict among adolescents in secondary schools. Uh, when you hear the word conflict, you might be thinking about uh, the term bullying, um, which is used to mean uh, relationships of um, power imbalance in which there is repeated abuse of one student against another. And that's what I mean by conflict, but I also mean mutual peer victimization in which two students and most often uh, their friends as well are engaged in a cycle of conflict, of teasing, of harassment, of physical fighting. Um, and I also mean uh, sexual harassment. So by student conflict, what I'm trying to um, indicate to you is any kind of behaviors in which students are making one another feel unwelcome, unaccepted, uncomfortable um, at school and, and self-conscious. Conflict um, has and bullying has been in uh, the media and has been the talk of public policy circles quite a bit lately. Um, a lot of this is due to the fact that social media and cell phone use among students has brought to the atten has brought uh, attention adults' attention to these kinds of behaviors, whereas previously they were often hidden uh, from the view of adults um, in hallways, in bathrooms, and so this has allowed us to renew a discussion about how to reduce conflict among students in schools. Um, particularly since we know that conflict is associated with students staying home from school more often, it's correlated with depression and with lower achievement. And just in general, this is something that we don't want to come to characterize our schools in ways that it has been characterizing schools lately, in particular with um, a lot of analysts saying that schools have come to have a climate of, of conflict. But if we're going to talk about how to reduce conflict in schools, then we need to talk seriously about what is the source of that conflict. And when parents and researchers and public policymakers talk about the sources of conflict, they generally fall within uh, one of two camps on this thinking about what is the source of conflict. And I would say the first camp says that when we observe conflict, we think that it's because of the way that students um, have been raised or because of the ways that students have been taught. And so in order to reduce it, we need to work on students' character. Uh, we need to teach them skills like empathy. Okay. Another camp would say, well, it's not really as much about the individual students as much as it is about their entire society. Um, we have commentators saying that we live today in a bullying society and that our schools are little microcosms of that. And the climate itself involves everything from uh, the administrative structure of the school, the physical structure of the school, uh, the rules, and then the greater society all around that, our laws, our anti-discrimination laws, and so forth. So what do we make of these different explanations? Well, psychological research, and I'm a social psychologist, uh, would discourage us, I think, from putting too much weight on the character of individual kids. Um, there's some research that shows that students don't enjoy the conflict, uh, that they don't support it, but they often feel as though they can't argue against it, they can't stand up against it, and they fear that they'll be punished by their peers, ostracized, uh, for being what we have often urged them to be, which is an active bystander. Other research shows that these kids' fears are borne out, and so in studies where students are asked to judge um, active bystanders, uh, they often say that they like these students less than the students who haven't spoken out in these kinds of uh, scenarios that they're faced with. So what about the, the climate hypothesis? Um, the research that I just described to you suggests that there's something more to uh, what we would call students' expectations of conflicts. And so where are they getting these expectations? And this is the, where the other camp says, well, they're getting these expectations from teachers and from the way the school is set up and from our laws and our rules um, in their immediate environment. This makes sense. There's got to be some truth to it. And as a social psychologist, we believe that there's an interaction between the individual, uh, their character, their values, um, and the social environment in which they find themselves. But there's also a problem with just stopping at this analysis of it's the climate. Um, there's three reasons, at least, uh, why this could be problematic. One is that when we say climate, we're pointing to so many different kinds of factors. We're pointing to the, the rules of the school and the administration and the teachers and the students. Um, the second is that the word climate itself communicates something about our assumptions about change. 
Uh, we, use, we invoke the word climate, we invoke the word culture when we're trying to describe something that is deeply entrenched, slow, that has evolved over time. And our schools right now are struggling with these two assumptions. One, that they need to tackle all of these different factors, and two, that it's going to take a lot of time. I want to suggest a third reason why just stopping at this analysis of climate is problematic because it implies that it's the adults who need to be the ones to act. Adults are the ones who control the rules, who control the administration, uh, who control the media. Um, and this really disempowers students in this equation. It's not students who are really part of this solution. And what I'd like to argue to you today is that the theories um, that we're working on in identity um, and in perceptions of social standards um, and identity groups would suggest that there's a third way to look at this problem. Um, and specifically, I'd like to draw your attention more to the idea that student behavior is caused by their perceptions of social standards at the school. And these perceptions, these psychological, psychologically generated ideas are much more malleable than these larger scale climate factors like laws and administrations and, and schools' physical structures. Specifically, what we'd like to suggest is that students are constantly observing one another in their environments. They're observing one another's behavior. And the behavior of other students to whom they're connected, whom they're observing, give them ideas about what is normal in a situation and what's even desirable. So for example, when students observe someone posting a negative comment on a social media site, um, this gives them the idea that this is a common thing to do. This is a typical thing to do. Uh, likewise, when they observe a student being ostracized by other students for reporting to a teacher, something distressing that's going on, they observe that it's undesirable to be reporting these kinds of behaviors. So in other words, social psychologists call these ideas uh, perceived norms. Um, these kinds of ideas about social standards are driving students' behavior. They're driving students' behavior because they're trying to live up to the expectations of their social group. So what you'll see in a lot of these um, discussions about school climate is that people will urge teachers uh, to communicate social standards to students. They'll put this onus on teachers. And that is a very important factor, but it can't be the only thing because what we know about social identities and social groups is that students have to maintain their reputation and maintain their status by living up to the expectations of their peers. And if their peers' behavior is, con is communicating this idea that participating in conflict is a way to maintain your reputation, then they're going to be motivated to do this um, as socially savvy beings, not as um, individuals um, without empathy or who need some kind of character education. So we've been working on this idea with my research group, um, and specifically the idea that there might be certain students in a school who are more powerful when it comes to setting social standards of that school. We're very interested in the idea that perhaps you don't need to address every single student in the school, but perhaps some of them. Um, and uh, we try to find these by using social network analysis. Perhaps some of them might be quite powerful in shaping their peers' expectations for what behaviors are typical, what behaviors are desirable, as a way of gaining insight in how to reset these standards towards standards that are much more tolerant and accepting of lots of different types of students. With my colleague, Hannah Shepard, uh, we've been doing some studies in which we ask students, who have you spent time with in the last week, either online or face to face? And we use their responses to these questions to build a social network like this one, where you see that all of the gray circles there are students at the school. The yellow colored circles are students who we like to call social reference. Social reference are the students who we think might have a powerful influence over shaping students' expectations of what is normal and desirable at their school. We've identified at least two different kinds of social reference. Uh, we call them the widely knowns and the click leaders. And as you can see, uh, the young girl who's at the center of both of these uh, fictionalized depictions of what it would look like if you zoomed in on them in this social network show that widely known students have connections to students all across the, the social network. So many, in fact, that not all of these students are even connected to one another. These students aren't necessarily popular, but they do have a status in which students know these are people who a lot of people know, who a lot of people look at in our school. The click leaders, on the other hand, are at the center of social groups that may not be as mainstream. Um, oftentimes, the word click is associated with popularity. Um, but here, what we mean is that these students may 
stick to themselves um, in the school. These students are often also not as much noticed by teachers when it comes to choosing student leaders um, for change efforts at a school. What's important about reaching out to these click leaders um, as well as to the widely known students is that cliques are, are very well known for defining their identity as against the mainstream of the school. So if you wanted to reach out to the widest number of students at the school, you'd want to reach out to these students as well, to their leaders, to try to convince them that yes, we are also participating um, in these new standards. So how would we go about testing this idea that social reference can spread new ideas about social standards of behavior and behavior itself? Um, being behavioral scientists, we did an experiment. We went into a high school and we measured their social network, as I had just um, described to you earlier. Uh, and we identified the students who were widely known, the students who were click leaders, and we randomly selected some of them to participate in a year-long campaign against conflict at the school. Others who weren't selected simply didn't participate in the program. There was no intervention for these students. And what we did is over time, over the course of the year, um, as students participated in this campaign by associating their faces with slogans that they had designed um, to try to reduce these kinds of behaviors at their school, um, at the end of the school year, we tracked um, the students who were connected to these social reference versus the students who were connected to those social reference who had not participated. And the bottom line is that we find that they, in fact, are very influential over the people to whom they are connected. So when we asked students at the end of the year um, whether it's normal to start drama at their school, starting drama is their way of talking about bullying, for example, one way of talking about bullying at this school. Um, students who had been connected to these, these social reference were significantly less likely to say that it was normal. They also communicated other kinds of social standards. For example, it's OK to ignore rumors. They were much more likely to say this if they were connected in the network to one of these students. Um, but it wasn't just their perceptions. It was also their behavior that changed. So we gathered administrative data at the school about whether these students had been disciplined for peer conflict. We surveyed teachers in separate surveys to ask them, are these students contributing to a negative environment? And it turned out that those who were connected to these social reference, their behavior was also likely to change. They were less likely to be nominated by teachers uh, for bad behavior, more likely to be nominated as students who would even defend others from harassment. So what this shows us is that social reference can have a powerful influence on the students to whom they are connected. But the question is, did they have an effect on the climate, the entire climate of the school? And that's something that we couldn't answer with this research. What we needed to do is to be able to compare this school in which we were intervening to a school in which we weren't present. The, the, the program wasn't there at all. And with the support of CIFAR, this is, in fact, what we did this year. We went into 56 different middle schools uh, in New Jersey um, and measured the networks of every single school, uh, which involved 24,000 children. We then went into half of these schools, randomly selected, and conducted a program in which we invited their school's social reference students um, to participate in another campaign against conflict at their school. Another twist that we, um, that we used in this uh, particular experiment is that we invited varying amounts of non-social reference to also participate in, in the program so that we could test not just can social reference change the conflict, the, the climate of conflict at their entire school, overall levels and patterns of, of um, student conflict, but are they necessary? Can other students do this as well? What is their contribution? So first, what they did, all of these students, was decide what they did, in fact, want to change about their school. And uh, our, our program uh, was called uh, the Roots Program. I mention this just because it's an important point, again, about student social identity. Uh, many interventions will ask students to repeat uh, phrases about conflict that, are, that have been delivered to them by adults. And what we thought was that the messages about social standards would be much more authentic if they were coming from students who had decided for themselves what is it that we really want to change, what's going on at our school. And in, these are some examples of, of things that students brought up as things that they would like to change about their school. Some of, you, some of them you might recognize as classic stories of bullying um, that adults talk about in the media, but many of them were not. But still, they were valid. They were of concern to these students. They were causing them distress. Uh, from there, what the students did was launch their own campaign. They um, 
uh, had lots of different um, strategies for doing so, including designing slogans and signing their names to it, again, to make very salient that they were the ones who were promoting this kind of new social standard. Um, they gave out wristbands with um, some of the slogan words on them when they recognized someone at their school doing something good as a reward uh, and uh, as an extra motivation. So what did we find? Well, first of all, they were extremely successful at getting students at their schools to talk about conflict. And what you see in this graph is just a higher level overall, independent of how many social reference were part of the group, in getting to people at the school to talk about conflict, compared, again, to the schools where we weren't doing this intervention program. But here's a critical graph. At each school, we also gathered disciplinary data to ask how much overall peer conflict was there at the school. We, these are data actually from the school's administrative records. And what you see here is that, again, there is an effect of having this intervention at your school. There was lower overall peer conflict in um, such a way that you could maybe suggest that this was an entire climate change. This effect size um, is equivalent to every single student in an intervention school having one less incident of getting pulled into the office for conflict over the course of the school year. But what you also notice about this graph is that the difference between intervention and treatment and uh, the intervention and the no intervention schools grows the more social reference you add to the group. So the social reference are the ones who are driving um, in part, this behavioral change. Having more of them, having at least a quarter of them is what leads to uh, this kind of overall school change. So I'd like to end there and, um, and say that, for one, I think that one emerging lesson from this research, which is still ongoing, is a very exciting one, which suggests that it's students themselves who can be involved in setting the standards of a school climate. Uh, note that we did nothing to change um, some of the larger factors of climate over the course of this study. We didn't train the teachers. We didn't change the administrative structure or any of the rules. This was all due to student changed behavior over the course of, uh, of the year. The other thing I want to point out is that um, what this what this research suggests, it redirects our attention from these larger scale factors of a school um, to more subtle factors of social perception and social identity. Um, these are, in fact, what we would like to suggest, the, cult the sort of psychological underpinnings of, of culture, um, how we understand the social standards of our environment. Um, another exciting thing is that while we can identify certain social reference in a group who can make these changes, um, it wasn't necessarily an elite task force of social reference students who accomplished these kinds of large-scale behavioral change at their schools. Um, the, most, uh, the, the highest proportion of social reference in these intervention groups at the schools uh, was a third. So in fact, what these students did was build an alliance of students who were willing to help, um, who were not necessarily at the center of their social networks, along with students who were, in fact, some of the more salient leaders of their school. So I'd like to leave you with those thoughts and to say finally that um, this kind of research doesn't disregard the importance of large scale factors. Um, but it does redirect our attention uh, to some of the ways in which social identity and social perceptions uh, can change these large scale uh, climates of culture in our schools and, and perhaps elsewhere. Thank you.